welcome to Noise Creators Episode 2. This is technically kind of our first real episode because this is the first one that kind of shows the format that we're going to have most of this time, which is me talking to a producer so you can get to know them, learn something from them. Hopefully, if you're a musician, learn about creating. If you're just a music fan, learn about what's going on behind your favorite records. And if you're somebody thinking about working with Casey, hearing how he works and... Uh, I think that that's a really valuable thing in this day and age because that's what Noise Creators is all about. So, with that, I kind of preemptively gave away the game. This episode's with Casey Bates. Casey and I are about the exact same age, came up at a very similar time. So we got along very, very well, and I really enjoyed this talk, and it was like kind of awesome because like it felt like we were friends already because it was so easy for him and I to talk, and it's because, as you'll discover... Casey and I have a ton in common. You might know Casey because he's done a ton of work with Portugal the Man, Chiodos, Pierce the Veil, Memphis Mayfire, Gatsby's American Dream, He Is We, Foxy Shazam, MXPX, This Providence, and Forgive Durden. It's a pretty cool list. He's going to tell you all about that stuff, and we're going to have an awesome conversation. Take a listen. Thanks so much for being here. Um, so what's your chain for recording your voice today? Ooh, my chain is uh, a Rode NT2A uh, large condenser microphone, large diaphragm condenser, condenser, and into a Focusrite ISA mic pre into my Pro Tools 11 HD rig. Nice. So tell me about your background in music. Background in music would be, I didn't even start I, I don't even consider i don't even think i listened to real music until high school which is kind of wow. crazy my, so why was that my parents have never been big music buffs i mean they listened to some cool stuff i mean we were you know growing up it was like a lot of simon and garfunkel which uh, you know i love now and you know but there was not a there wasn't a very eclectic mix like no rock and roll at all like zero and so i mean i missed out on everything from the, <laughs> like this you know even even they didn't really listen to beatles that much so when I, I mean, I think my first record ever was Criss Cross, that, you know, that rap group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was my first CD. And, oh, man, it was a rough few years after that. You, you, know? you, you, you are in a similar boat here. I, I was Fat Boys crushing, but I definitely got that one, too. <laughs> well, so wait, how old are you? I'm 37. Oh, okay. I'm 36. Okay. We're okay gonna yeah, have, so, yeah. we'll, we'll have some similar things to talk about growing mm-hmm. up. But yeah, it was a few years. You know, I think I started getting into rock and roll. I remember I bought like the uh, the, the big Soundgarden record with Black Hole Sun on it. Mm-hmm. And I was, and I remember listening to that record going, oh man, this is just so heavy. This is so crazy. I shouldn't be listening to this. And, you know, I kind of found uh, punk rock in high school. And that's what really kind of got me going musically and a, and a buddy of mine started playing guitar and, and I remember I went over to his house one day and he's and he's sitting there he's playing guitar and he's he's playing a song I heard on the radio like he's in and I'm and my mind was blown I was like how are you playing a song that's on the radio because I mean you're I'm so naive, and I'm like, I'm like, they're on the radio because no one else can do what they do. You know, that's what I'm ah, thinking. That's a, that's and, an interesting thought. I, you don't hear expressed often. Yeah, you know, I didn't. It's just one of the, you know, I didn't know anything about it, and I was like, I thought they were experts. You know, it's like Michael Phelps swimming at the Olympics. I'm like, no one else can do that, and so, and I like went home and begged my parents for a guitar, and I mean, I just never put it down for the next like five or six <laughs> years. So you didn't don't put it down, and when do you end up in a band? Uh, start a band in high school, um, with my best friend, and it's a <laughs> we it was. I mean, it was punk rock. We wanted it to be, and I mean, it's just terrible. And, and I did that for through through high school. Just it was a couple different bands, awful stuff. And then uh, after high school, moved to Seattle, started took same best friend I had then. Um, started in a band in Seattle, another punk rock band, and really started like figuring stuff out. Like I started recording stuff on my own. I mean, with real old school basic software, you know, you that you get for free on the internet back then. But yeah, I mean, nice. So, what drew you to want to record and become a producer? You know, I didn't. Um, when I was in a band, I didn't. I didn't like playing live so much I, I'm not like I don't like having a lot of attention on me I'm not that 
I, I was always awkward and just never felt comfortable doing it. But I, I found that I loved like trying to record my band. Like I liked the behind the scenes stuff so much more. And when we were in that that band, I we went to like Guitar Center. I think we each, you know, I don't know, four members in the band. I think I think the goal was each of us had to save five hundred bucks, and we're going to take two thousand dollars to Guitar Center. We're going to buy everything we need to record a, a record ourselves, which was insane. You know, even and so so this is like what the mid nineties or something. This would have been no uh, ninety nine two thousand. Okay, but that's still that's still at that time. That's a pretty bold move. Oh yeah, I mean. I remember this. I remember the software was called N Track. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think the guy still makes it. Or I, I, it wasn't too long ago. I looked it up, and I think he was still going with it. But and you know, it was. I think it was free at the time, and it was better than a four track. You know, mm-hmm. and, and man, I didn't. You know, it, it's one of those things where. I, it's like I thought, you know, w- like when I saw my buddy play guitar and I'm like, I can't believe anyone can do this. And then I got pretty good at guitar. I'm like, well, maybe I'll be able to do the same thing with recording. And, it, you know, it didn't work. And just like I went to Guitar Center and, you know, I'm like, I hear we're supposed to use an SM57, you know, and then you go in there and they're like, oh, no, you want to use this Sennheiser, you know, whatever they're, you know, told to, to hawk at Guitar Center. And he gave us all the these weird mics and all this weird stuff. And, and then I literally tried to go out and try to I just tried to figure it out and I didn't know anything about compression or EQ. I remember we record my drummer and and uh, his snare, I, we'd look at the waveform after he would record, you know, in the snare drum, you could see where he was hitting softer and louder and softer and louder. And I'm like, how can you not just hit it perfect every single time? Like, look <laughs> at this thing, you know, it, it was just, it, it was, it was an incredible learning experience because later on when I took it really seriously, I'd already spent a couple years doing everything wrong. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, but and even like, that basic instinct that you have, like that's inconsistent. Yeah. So many people just stare at that and go, "Oh, well, that's just what drummers do." And you have that instinct to go, "You know, we can do this better," and that's yeah. very helpful as a producer. <laughs> totally. So you buy this software, you're recording your own band. How does it evolve from there to you becoming a producer that records other bands? I mean, this we're talking the early early two thousands, and I end up parting ways with the band and I just I, I kind of leave music and I and I, I went and worked like retail I think I worked at like Old Navy and Zoomies and you know whatever I, I did that for a couple of years and I finally I was like I don't know I might have been like 23 or 24 and I'm like all my all my best friends were in college and they were you know getting ready to graduate college and and uh, I was like man I gotta figure out what I want to do and so like, I just sat down one day I'm like I'm gonna I'm going to do sound for movies. Like, that's what I want to do. And so I went and enrolled uh, at the Art Institute of Seattle for, uh, I wanted to do sound for movies. And I, when I got there, um, yeah, I mean, there must have been 100 students and, and the, every, sing, every single one of them wanted to be a record producer. And I, w- I was the only one I wanted to do sound for movies. And they have, you know, they, they do that there. Like you can learn, you know, they just basically are trying to teach you audio engineering. And I have my thoughts on vocational schools. I don't, I think it's, I think it's pretty much a waste of money, but. Yes. Uh, <laughs> this, this, is I, a, this is something that's been coming up on this podcast over and over again for any of the future aspirational producers out there. I think that this is a consensus we've formed so far. <laughs> Yeah, it's not. I mean, I firmly believe that that you can't teach talent, and in in a lot of ways, that's what you're they're trying to do, and they're doing it with you know professors and stuff that they aren't in the field anymore. I mean, they're not you know. Oh, you know, what I had this conversation with somebody because you do the creative live stuff, right? I do. Yes. Yeah. I just did my first one. Um, oh yeah, and... Finn. Finn was telling me I hung out with Finn this uh, week. Oh cool, yeah, yeah, he's awesome. And it's it's one of those things where that what I love what they're doing is they're using people that are actually in the business right here and now doing stuff that you know people that are learning from us can see the work we're doing. You know, and when you go to these vocational schools, it's a lot of times like you know they're guys that got out of the business 10, 15 years ago, and they're you know they're they're out of touch is I guess the best way to put it and. You know, I, but I, I was focused and I said, I wanted to, I wanted to finish this. And it was really easy because I, you know, after dicking around for a few years, I, I was, I just wanted to get through something and actually finish it. And so, I mean, I think our class started with a hundred and I think 20 graduated, you know, I mean, it's just, it, every, when everyone realizes they're not going to be a record producer, they just kind of, it starts dropping like flies. So even up to the very end, I still was trying to do like sound mixing for, for video and Part of the school projects is to, is to do uh, to work with a band and record them. My best friend, the guy that was in high school, I learned guitar from, and did the band with. Well, he had started a band in Seattle called Gatsby's American Dream, and his name's Bobby Darling. And 
Gatsby's was this signed band that had a couple records under their belt and, you know, at least in the Seattle scene was doing really well selling, you know, a lot of kids were coming out to their shows and I was like, dude, can I use you guys to do this? You know? And, and he's like, Oh sure. You know, like, and so I got, I got this, this band, this actually talented band to come in and, and record with, and it came out awesome. Like it really, I mean, by you know my standards now it's not but i mean compared to like what everyone else in my class was putting out and even what my instructors were doing it was it was really cool and i started getting a lot of attention from like local other local bands from this one song i did because i mean and gatsby's was so good to me just like you know you know hyping my name to anyone you know like hey go record with this guy you know and i was ridiculously cheap i mean i was free for (laughs) forever because i just wanted experience and I honestly just kind of fell into it and you know I mean I'd always loved music and stuff and and it was just one of those things where it just happened so organically and just ha- I happened to be in the right place at the right time and and have the skill set you know and in the right I think mindset to you know I wasn't in it to make crazy money you know right away I was just like I was like I had this idea of like I'm going to record bands for free and then if I get booked three or four weeks out, I'm going to start charging them like 50 bucks a song. And then, you know, and then it, I was still booked out three or four weeks. And then I started charging a hundred bucks a song, you know, and kind of just snowballed from there. And, and you know, the, this is the funny thing is, is this is the best advice. Like my father was a freelancer for his entire career. And he'd always just tell me, he's like, you know, you're too busy, raise your rate. You're too, if you're not busy, lower your rate. And you're doing that just kind of naturally. And I think that's what gets people in a freelance field ahead. Absolutely. Totally agree. So you do this song with, with, with them, and when do you start feeling like, wow, this is my job and you're not having to do anything else to subsidize it? Um, well, continuing with like what I was saying before, the, you know, I, I, think, I think I was like booked like two months out, you know, and I was charging like, a, I don't know, 150 bucks a song or something. And I would, and all of a sudden I'm making more money than I ever did, you know, working at Old Navy, you know, and, and it's I'm like, whoa, maybe I should, you know, maybe I should do this. And so I, I like sold my car at the time. I, you know, I'd saved a bunch of money and to buy some cool car. And, and I was like, you know, I don't need it. I don't need a car. I'm going to just going to go for this. And, you know, and so I, I sold my car, you know, had several grand and then just like bought a bunch of like decent gear and, and said, all right, I'm, this is going to be my job, right, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future, I'm going to give this a go. And I mean, that's really how it started. I mean, I was from, I think I graduated our institute in like, uh, oh, four or like very early oh four. And then, I mean, I was already doing my first record. I, I think I did two records that first year by the end of that first year. And it, it just kind of, I were, and I worked hard, man. I was like no days off, just nonstop. It was crazy. Uh, that, I think that's one of the necessary parts of when you start doing this is it's like you got to just go and take every opportunity you can and days off or yeah. uh, and social life are a thing to be laid to rest for a little while. Yep. <laughs> um, so you have your own studio? Uh, I, you know what? I have a mixing editing room that's like a, you know, I got my all my gear and pro tools here, but I, I, I no longer run a full studio. I did that for years and I, and I'm I honestly quite a bit happier not being, not running a full studio. I can understand that. <laughs> yeah. You got a nice place uh, in New York, right? Yeah. I'm right outside New York in uh, Union City, but uh, there's many times that I'm sitting in my home studio right now and I'm just like, ah, if only I could just sit here and be alone all day. <laughs> Sometimes, <laughs> right? um, and then, you know, you get a great band and, and then you, you, you feel different at times. But uh, so did you just play guitar or do you play other instruments? What, what do you what have you was your path on that? Uh, yep. Just guitar. I uh, I never was on the songwriting side of things like I, you know, even even when I was in bands, I, I had an opinion for sure about everything. You know, I was very like, you know what? I, I knew what I liked and didn't like. But like, I don't know, maybe it kind of goes back to the whole like not wanting to be the center of attention or whatever. I mean, like I, I don't even play guitar that much anymore. I mean, I used to be able to shred for a bit and I, you know, I just don't, I, I hardly ever pick it up anymore. And, and I'm interested in stuff. I'd love to be able to play the drums. I, I, I mean, it's kind of one of those things is, uh, as are you, do you play drums? I, drums and keyboards are my instruments. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, 
I, it's 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 a weird thing for me because I've been doing this for so long. I know drums so well, and and I know how to play them. I can't make my hands and legs do it the way you know. It's like I I like I I know more than most drummers I record about drums, but I can't physically you know. I mean, I, it's, it takes practice, obviously, and I'm I'm just not I'm not sitting down and doing it, but. Uh, but I I, th- I I identify with you because like I haven't played drums for more than five minutes in probably a decade, and it's like right. I know how to show you how to do it. I know how to play two fills pretty decently to show you how to hit those, but I can't actually you know do anything more than that at yeah. this point because I haven't. I mean, I haven't played a live gig in thirteen years. Yeah, yeah, me neither. <laughs> yeah. So you play guitar when you work with a band um if like we call like one side of the spectrum steve albini who doesn't think you should really tell the band anything about their songs and maybe you'll guide the performance a little or talk about take and then you have a john feldman who like will rewrite your whole record where do you see yourself most commonly from project to project like if it's the average project falling on that spectrum uh, it's actually funny you brought up albini because that record or sorry the uh the letter he wrote to uh I think he write it to Kurt or, or yeah, Nirvana. Yeah, I, I, I think it was like one and the same. Yeah, yeah, and and that actually had a lot of uh, influence on me, especially in, in my early years, because you know, especially in recent years, you know, going through the recession and the music industry, and I saw a lot of producers really switching to being right, you know, songwriters. You know, I kind of made a decision at the beginning. I really identified with that letter as far as like he doesn't want a piece of you know your songwriting and all this stuff. Now I'm not full Albini like at all. Like I. I want to have an influence on the music. I want to have, you know, my ideas, you know, I want to be able to give my ideas and thoughts and stuff like that, but I'm I'm never going in and writing parts for bands and I also don't like it, the other thing is I I personally feel it gets messy when it comes to like publishing and like, you know, I don't really want to have that conflict when it comes to working with a band. I want to I just I've always considered my my job and I tell bands this is like I feel like my job is to is to deliver you the best version of you guys, you know, and, and I'm going to interject and I'm going to say the things I like and don't like about parts, but I want it to be as much you as possible. And so that's kind of, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not on the Feldman at all. Uh, so I'm kind of, I know somewhere in the middle, uh, but not a lot of writing. I don't sit down and, and uh, rework, you know, chord progressions and stuff with bands. I work, I do a lot of structuring. I mean, that's kind of the one thing I will do, but uh yeah, I don't really get into like lyrics aside from like, yeah, that's, you know, that's too cheesy or, you know, let's maybe think of something else to say, a different way to say this kind of a thing. Yeah, I and I think that there's a thing of like, you know, you decide what you want to be, it's about taste and, you know, it's just that thing of like, I don't really want to work with bands that want me to rewrite their whole entire song for them. And I like, I like to work with a band that has enough talent and vision because it's just not that interesting to me to do like no. your, all your work for you that you're supposed to do and what will make you special. Cause we have 40 records that are really me and that character is just not interesting to me. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I really wish there was a little bit more of a way to separate the, these things, you know, like as far as like, cause when someone says producer, you don't, I mean, everything falls under this umbrella of like, you could be Albini or you could be Feldman and you don't really. Or the hip hop thing where it's like the producers 90% of the time, the guy who's yeah. writing the song and just basically tell you everything what to do, except what to rap about. Yeah. And so I've, you know, it's been a struggle. I've had a few, you know, mishaps where I'm talking, you know, or I, I the worst I had was I had a band come in that I, I mean, I just kind of dropped the ball as far as like talking to them ahead of time and stuff, but they came in and had like no lyrics and no melodies at all for us, for their, we were like, I think we were just working together on like a song to see how we'd work together. And they come in and they go, well, we need you to to write the, the, the lyrics and melodies. I'm like, well, I'm like, what? I'm like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna. And he's like, well, the last guy we, we recorded with, he did all the lyrics and melodies for us. I'm like, well, you know, it's 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 that thing of like, well, you're a producer, so you write all our parts. You know, I'm like, it's. I wish there was like a different names, you know, for the. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 I think that that's just sadly some bad communication, and really because there's no school bands go to. Like I always joke about yeah. with like the book I wrote. It's like I was just trying to solve some things, so there's not such like lunacy going around sometimes with this stuff because that is not what a producer is meant to be, and even when we talk about the hip hop thing, like there's oftentimes still just the writer and then the producer gets performances from people and chooses direction and some other ideas. But like, whew, that's rough. Yeah. 
Yeah. And that's actually like the worst horror story I've heard of that. And I've talked to a lot of people about this. So. Oh, that was like one of the most frustrating. Uh, I just like I, I felt I felt bad. But at the same time, I was kind of pissed. I'm like, because I'm just oh, you, this whoever you uh, whoever they worked with, like, did you such a disservice, like as far as like growing as a as an artist? And it, uh, it just drives me nuts. Well, that doesn't sound like it's the type of thing. Also, we should be putting artists on. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> so what do you bring to like, obviously, every record is going to be different. But like the majority of the time, what do you usually bring to a record as far as production goes? What, where, where do you fall on like police? Like, what do you like to say that you do? Just following up, it's that thing of I want the band, I want it to be their thing, but just the best version of them, you know. And I mean, that's in a nutshell. I think from like the sonic and like song part of it is that. Uh, but then the other side of the things is just the the process itself. Um, I I've had you know I've had a lot of like clients you know and bands that have come back around and worked with me again i mean like that's kind of one of my things that like i try to i try to like have it be a very enjoyable and fun experience for bands and i i think that's one thing that i tr- that i don't know i mean i know there's i know there's a ton of guys out there that are a blast to work with and in but i also hear so many horror stories from from the bands i've worked with where they've worked with somebody that's just a total dick or a flake and stuff and and so i i take the process side of it pretty seriously as far as keeping a pretty strict schedule and you know just keeping it all together and fun and keeping the momentum going um that's kind of one of those things that never really gets brought up when you you know you hear the a finished product and you hear a record and you kind of assume you know that's that's the guy but you know you you hardly ever hear about the actual process that went on behind it and so that's one of my i think strengths is just i feel like i'm pretty easy to work with uh, well, I remember one of the first I heard of you was from our mutual friend Jesse Corman from Number Twelve Looks Like You, and that, oh yeah, uh, Jesse. And you know, I think the first I had heard was that he came back and he was singing your praises and said many of those same things. But I, I think you do make a good point. Is that you know you are always hearing horror stories, and you know I think that that's one of the things is like you try not to be that horror story. <laughs> no, totally. <laughs> what is one of the biggest mistakes you see bands do before getting to the studio, aside from not writing melodies and lyrics? <laughs> <laughs> that would be the biggest. Uh, you know, a general lack of uh, being prepared uh, would probably be my number one thing. I've done I've done too many records where I. I I don't I haven't heard a single song or a piece of new music until they are at my front door, you know, and we're about to start doing that record. For whatever reason, you know, there's no amount of like, hey, I need some demos or I, you know, they just they can't get it together enough in, you know, that kind of work ethic bleeds through a process and it makes I mean, it, then it becomes my job becomes much tougher because I'm trying to immediately cut through this BS of like you know the fact that they're not that hardworking and they just kind of you know and so I've got to try to elevate it and bring it up real quick and like let's get going let's just do this and I, I, yeah my number one thing is is bands need bands need to just to be more prepared when they get in the studio. So I, I mean one of the things I often say is is every bit of work you do before you get to the recording studio is about five to ten times more important than the work you do when you're there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, sadly, that just goes in one ear out the other. It hits the wall and dies. I know. How awesome is it, though, when you do get a guy, when a, a band or a guy that is just on top of it, and oh. it's just, it makes you, like, I mean, th- there's those days where, I mean, I, I would rather be back at Old Navy folding T-shirts, you know, and but then, like, you get those days where there's not, I'd rather be doing nothing else, you know? This is just the most fun, and it's... It's crazy how this job can go from one end of the spectrum to the other. I, I, that's a totally great point. And it's like, um, and I definitely lived the exact same thing. And I think one of the funny things is, is it's like, you know, there's no single quality that's an indicator of a band that's going to go somewhere and get some fans, whether it's a hundred, being able to draw a hundred people locally or being able to draw a hundred thousand nationally. But one of the few indicators that without a fail is I've never seen one in my 20 years of doing this that comes to the studio that unprepared and ends up being a band that has a hundred people at their show, even locally. Right. Right. Like there's a quality that like when the musicians listen to this, like 
being unprepared walking into the studio if you really want this. That's a guaranteed way to failure. No, I totally agree. Totally agree. So what's a smart thing bands can do during the recording process to make their record better? I mean, aside from, you know, like you're saying, being prepared when you come in. But one of the things I think that gets a little bit overlooked by bands is is just doing research about the role you're going to be playing in this process and how recording, you know, your instrument or your vocals or, you know, is how that process happens in what you should be doing to adjust how you do that, you know, for a recording. And I guess probably the biggest example would be would be like drums and how uh, if if a drummer, you know, it's just a few Googles, you know, and like and like look up some of your favorite records that, you know, and you're going to you're going to see, oh, that drummer's not playing this the same way, you know, in the studio as he does live, you know, and his the way he has his drum set up is not the same way in the studio as he does live or at the practice space or, you know, and it it can be that way. I mean, it can be that way for everything from, from vocals to bass to guitars to keys, you know, just kind of just doing a little bit of work. And, and, and that can even be just hitting me up ahead of time and being like, hey, I got questions about how we're going to be recording this or doing this. And I mean, I would, you know, I'd like, you know, I guess in a perfect world, it would be my job to fully prepare these bands before they come in. But there's there's just too much to cover, you know. And, yeah, and there's so, no there's no way to compensate for every hole that can be a leak in this uh, cheese cheese cloth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What happens when you and a band disagree about something in the studio? I'm I'm a I'm easygoing and. I will, depending on how things are moving, uh, I will let, I'll let it go and let them figure out that they were wrong. (laughs) You know, know, cool. Cause I'm, I am so big on momentum. I'm so big on just keeping stuff going. Like, I don't like working long hours. Like my, my ears get fatigued. Like I, I mean, it's just happened too many times where I'm like, 10 hours with a click track and a loud guitar going and I literally am losing like I I can't I don't even understand what's happening anymore and so I like to get in there and I don't I hardly take any breaks I just go and so when I when I when it comes to something like confrontation I will usually let them if 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 they're recording a part and they're passionate about doing it this way and I will kind of like all right let's just let's do that a few times you know let's see how this goes and let them kind of work it out on their own before, instead of me like just shutting it down and being like, dude, nope, not going to do it. Um, and, and them getting butt hurt and, and, you know, all of a sudden they're a little bit bummed and they, their idea is not going to come through. And so, you know, but in, in, and like, you know, this, you know, our job is to be like, I mean, we're babysitters and kind of psychologists in this weird way yes. of like, there are those, you know, there every musician is different in their personality. And so there are those guys where that disagreement needs to be handled as gently as possible. And like with just baby hands and like really let them work it out on their own and figure it out. And then there's the guys that are just like, I I literally can be like, that sucks. Do something else. And we laugh and we move on to the next thing. And so it's, it's a, it's a, it's a range of, I guess the real answer to that question is I'm constantly adapting to how to deal with a situation, but the main thing is I keep I try to keep as little friction in that you know how I'm dealing with that as possible. No, that's a great answer. And one of the things I really like that you keep touching on is this momentum thing. And can you talk like so you talked about one thing like where I think that this is actually like a great point to me is like I'm totally with you that like long hours don't make better records and anybody mm-hmm. I know who's been doing this for more than a few years agrees on that that like there's a certain point where getting new tones and getting performances, you're just going to redo them. But tell me how a band should see momentum and like what you do, keep momentum without it being a 16 hour day where they feel like, I feel like so many bands feel like it's a loss when they don't pull an all nighter on a record when really it's a gate. No, uh, it's, I'm, uh, man, I'm trying to think of when I'd, you know, I, like after working my first few years and just like a dog and not having time off and then realizing that I, I, I have no life anymore. Like I have no time for my girlfriend and I'm not doing anything else. I'm not thinking about anything else. My, like 
physically, I'm unhealthy, I'm not, you know, it just, and because you're thinking, like, I have to do this, like, I have to go this hard, and at some point down that line, I go, you know what, I need, like, I'm running this show, like, if, if I don't, you know, because I'm, when, when, when someone hires me to do a record, I'm, I'm dictating how much time I'm going to spend on this thing, I mean, I can do, you might have X amount of dollars, and I can decide, I could do this in two days, but they're going to be 16 hour days, or I can do it in four days and eight hours a day. I'm all of a sudden a lot more comfortable. I'm not making as much money in a short amount of time, but there's the benefits of, you know, of my own sanity. And so, uh, you know, I, I, when I talk to bands now, I, I'm pretty upfront about the fact that I like there to be a schedule. Um, I, I try to, if, if we're going to be doing like loud stuff, like if we're going to be doing guitars, I really try to stick between like six and eight hours, but it's six and eight hours intense. Like we, when we are starting, we are going to go and I'm, you know, if I'm stopping for lunch, it's like a less than, you know, I'm going to grab my sandwich. I'm going to eat while we're going to keep going. And it's just like, I want, I want the player to be warmed up and go and happy and flowing. And so, uh, and I'm losing track of the original question. Well, it was just more how you keep momentum going, but I think this is a great point too, because like, I think, you know, there's also that thing of like when people hear eight hours, they think of like cigarette breaks every hour. They think of right. oh, like an hour for lunch and they're like, oh, my God, how am I going to get the record done? And, and I like I was I do a 10 hour day most of the time and I eat in front of the computer and I'm giving you instructions with a mouthful of something in my mouth. And I, yeah. I'm trying to keep it going so we get efficient momentum going. But I'm also not going. I also know that humanly possible your ears don't work well after somewhere around seven to eight hours yeah yeah especially if you're like trying to get new tones <laughs> that is the worst i mean yeah no, i i mean my i'd say my schedule is probably something along the lines like i'm an early riser so like i i'll usually get to the studio like nine and then i will work for you know two or three hours like maybe cleaning up the night before the day before stuff and kind of prepping for the day and then have the band you know maybe get in around noon and and then we're going for six hours like just we're gonna we're gonna hit it hard and, and then all of a sudden you know i've got kind of a normal schedule i can go home to my wife and and uh maybe go to the gym and be sane and and i i the other thing is like i need to be happy like i want to like it makes it makes me better at what i do if i'm not stressed out and i'm not worried about something and i can because like one of my favorite things is to like you know i'll i'll, I'll be working on stuff and i'll mix something down and then i'll I'll be able to go home and I'll go for a run and I'll put my, you know, my earbuds in and I'll listen to what we did and you almost hear it in a, in a different way. You hear, you know, outside of that and you, you get ideas and you get thoughts. And I mean, that's part of the process for me too, is just like being able to hear it from not this bubble that I'm, you know, in the studio. Yeah. And I, I think that that's like one of the, the funny things that doesn't get talked about too in records is like, you know, I don't know any producer who hasn't had a rough time and the record hasn't suffered from it, but as much as you can do to minimize that for your producer is more important than almost anything else going on. Like, I don't know anybody who's been doing this for more than a couple of years who can't look to a time in the record where they learned a lesson like, I can't go that hard or else my creativity and focus is lacking. Like it's hard enough to hit the level of concentration we have to hit every day. And that takes immense amount of practice for most people. But like, you know, you need to be in a good, healthy place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's exactly what you just said. I mean, th this job is when you're, there's no daydreaming. Like there's no like thinking about other stuff. Like there's no, like you're mentally engaged for that entire period and it's exhausting. I mean, <laughs> it, that's the other side of it is like, I mean, you can be doing, you know, you could be working a normal job and you're just kind of drifting off and doing other stuff. But man, this, this, there's no, there's no time for that. You, you're still, you gotta, you know, <laughs> there's been a handful of times where I forget to hit a stop when I'm recording because I am thinking about something else. But for the most part, you have to be there, and and that's you got to give yourself time to breathe and relax. Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's human. And oftentimes, when I forget to hit stop or I lose myself, it's like, oh well, that bridge. Now that I think about it, maybe it is eight bars too long. Yeah. And you know, it's just it takes a ton of focus. Um, so to switch gears, uh, yeah, do amp simulators have a role in your production? Uh, yeah, you know, um, the. 
I mean, I, I grew up playing guitar, and up until very recently, I have never DI'd. I mean, I not, shouldn't say never. Uh, I have 95% of the time not DI'd guitars because I, I found I could never get them to sound the way I wanted them to sound. Um, I'm with you, yeah. You're, you, you grew up drumming. I'm sure you're definitely more in tune with the drumming side of things. I really wish I'd have been a drummer because like, I'm, I'm feel like I'm very in tune with guitar tones. Like I know like what I'm looking for. And so up until recently, and I say recently because I got one of the, the, uh, Kemper profilers. Have you oh, used okay. One of those yeah, yet? no, those are fantastic. I've only used it once, but I, I wanted to part with my money soon after. I mean, I couldn't, I, I, I was doing a record out in Jersey last year and I, the engineer at the studio had one and he's telling, I'm like, he's telling me about it. I'm like, yeah, whatever, dude. Like you can't, I mean, you know, and, and, and so we had some extra time one day and I, I, they had a JCM 900, which is like my favorite amp of all time and a Marshall. And, uh, and I was like, I was like, all right, let's just, let's, do, let's show me what this thing does, you know? And so we, we did the whole thing and it, and I mean, if people that aren't familiar, it's, it's this box that like, records the chain the tone in the chain of how you would record your guitar so like i'm just i put 57s on my guitars most of the time and so it's like a a 57 on a marshall lead cab you know mike goes right into this kemper profiler and then you come out of the profiler into the input on the amp and then it plays like these like white noises and beeps and boops and stuff and and it 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 records the the head the cab and the mic and the mic position and everything and it it takes that tone and and you can actually hit a b as you're doing it and man i, I was like i couldn't believe it when he was do, when we were doing it i was like he, he could switch between the two and i i mean whatever difference there was was just negligible i was like oh, this is insane you and you can just save every you know you can just do this to all your favorite amps and have this huge collection and and it's become one of the more widely used things in my studio and i'm and on the stuff i've been working on because i mean you've got this just treasure trove of guitar tones at your disposal and it's all real stuff recorded, you know, with real microphones, uh, you know, through real amps. And I mean, I, I found it to be just like invaluable. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely think those are, I think amp simulators are burgeoning technology and there's still some stuff that's terrible that brings down the reputation, but that's very good, uh, technology right there. Yeah. It's, it's the best I've heard. Yeah. How about sample drums? Uh, it depends on the project, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I've done everything in between and full replacement to none, no replacement. Uh, but uh, it, you know, it just depends on the type of project. Uh, you know, the heavier stuff tends to be pretty triggered out and replaced. Um, I'm not, I'm not against it. In fact, mm -hmm. I, I find uh, it's like. They're, it's just, they're both a blast to me. Like some, you know, it's, it's so much fun getting amazing real drum tones and, and they sound awesome. And then on the other side, it's like a lot, you know, when you get like a, a heavy, just tech band and they're like, they're, you know, they want it edited and chopped up. And then it's, it's also kind of fun, like a puzzle. You just kind of go in there and you're just edit, editing everything up and tightening it. And uh, I don't know. I, I love both ends of it. I, I, I like that way of the, the puzzle thing. Yeah, it really is true. It's like, oh, well, you know, technically it doesn't, hit that rhythm totally right let's go in and tweak that and maybe delete that and it's it's a fun fun puzzle to put together yeah and that, i mean that's kind of the way you got to look at it because there's too many guys that i know you know it's just they won't touch it because it's you know it's not you know they're like oh this isn't real music you know and i mean you know everyone's got their own opinions about it but i mean it's 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 almost I almost see it like pop music in a way, which is weird. But I mean, it's like the heaviest, you know, just cra screaming stuff. And and it, you, I feel like I assemble it like you I would a pop song, you know, with with you know drum machines and all that stuff. Nice. Uh, how about pitch correction? Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not against it. Uh, use it. I mean, pretty frequently. Uh, I bounce between, um, Melodyne. Waves tune and auto tune. I I I almost have to have all three because I I use them all f for kind of different things, like depending on the singer and what they're doing. Um, if I had to have just one, it would be Melodyne. I think it sounds the best. I just I do not like the workflow of Melodyne. Um, I I I I never would put. Uh, I don't like putting tun tuning plugins like live on a track uh like in, inserted in, as a plug -in. yeah agreed um, I, I mean i don't think anybody who gets good results does that yeah and so you know i'm 
I like to I like to work with the raw, you know, the audio files in in, you know, pick out lines and just focus on, you know, editing and tuning this part, you know, and and then committing to that. Uh and so I find Melodyne, I mean it, it has its ways. I like cuz I just use like Waves and I use AutoTune in in their audio suite formats and so I just, you know, I, I work with it that way, but yeah, uh it I, I try to do as little as possible, uh, and I try to make it sound as good as possible without it sounding too tuned. Uh, but yeah, how long do you like to take to work on a song, and then when? What is too long? You know, this is actually something that's a good point or a good question. I uh, I was recently working with a band, and and they they couldn't. There was just, we were spending so much time working on it, and uh, and just to the point where we're just beating it into the ground, beating it into the ground. And I, and I talked to another producer friend of mine and he's like, you know what, in his, his thing that he does, he actually has like a, an egg timer. And he, he, he has like, when you're getting to a point where you're like, man, I don't know that we're going to get anything valuable if we keep going with what we're doing here. And so he'll, he, he'll, you know, he'll set a clock for like an hour and say, all right, we're, we're going to work on this for another hour. And if we don't get what we want, we're moving on to the next thing. And, I think something like that, you know, and, and interestingly enough is you actually end up things it actually helps because you know the band the band's like, all right, we need to make a decision here and or else we're gonna have to abandon not abandon, but we're gonna move on to the next thing and we'll have to revisit this later. And it kind of helps depending on the the band, you know, sometimes they need that deadline of like, no, this this needs to happen right now. But I'm I'm very good with managing my time like i mean like i said i'm it's really important to me to have a life and to be able to and also to be able to deliver you know projects on time on budget and all that stuff and so it's just it's really important to me that the time is managed properly and so i'm not letting it's very rare that i let something get out of control uh i kind of stick to a rule of thumb of like i mean if i'm working with a band for like six days i mean i'm trying like three songs is pushing it for me like i really don't want to do more than that i mean i have you know but i mean i want it to be comfortable for everybody so um yeah i don't know i don't know if that really answers no the question, that, that, that that actually does i love that egg timer thing um i've recently got into a thing of like when it like hits the debate time i have a uh a round timer and it makes a beep every minute that we're wasting having a fight <laughs> Because <laughs> I tend to find it really minimizes the amount of time that people will sit and fight for when they realize, like, I'm saying the same thing six times, thinking of a new, res- I'm going to get a new result from it. Yeah. <laughs> wait, what, what, what? It's like a little. So I like have this thing. Uh, do you watch that show, Mr. Robot? Oh, yeah. So when he goes and meets the white whatever, and they have a timer for every minute it ticks so they don't waste their time. I stole yeah, yeah, yeah. it from that. So there's like a little app uh, called Round Timer, and it'll just literally beep every minute. Oh, that's cool. So, so I even do that I, show. Oh, that's the best show on TV. It's so long. I mean, I was like, uh, I just I couldn't believe it that because it's USA, and I was like, yeah. well, they don't have anything good. I, was, I, was, I, I watched that first episode. I was like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. It's like finally, it just feels like an it feels like a Fight Club, or you know, yeah. it's just something that it's like a newer like V for Vendetta or something. It's been a while, and it, but like. Really cool. I, I'm really excited to see where they go with it. Yeah, no, I, I mean, it, it, I had the same reaction. Like, I can't believe this is on USA, and I can't believe how good this is. And it's filmed all right around me, so it's like it's even cooler to just see. Like, oh, I walk by that building every day where he lives in the apartment and things like that. Oh, so good. Yeah. Anyway, so tell me about one of the best moments you've had in the studio. Not necessarily the best, but. Just a cool moment that maybe people could learn something for or, or uh, find fun. You know, uh, it might be... So I did a record that just came out uh, for this local band called The Money Pit. Um, okay, so this is the ex Gatsby's American Dream band? Yes, yes. And I, so, I heard the song, and you guys did a great job. It sounds awesome. Oh, thanks, dude. Yeah, I'm I'm like I'm I'm really proud of it. It's one of my favorite things I've ever done. The reason I think it's a good example for this is like so I mean I I've worked with these guys for a year. I mean, since the very beginning. I mean, a bit, you know, basically about 10 years now and you know, I saw them in the in the basically the early years and in going through all the stuff we've just been talking about like just the, you know, I'm dealing with personalities and stuff, and I've seen his band at their best, and I've seen them at their worst, and, you know, I've seen them unprepared, I've seen them prepared, and so, you know, they kind of, they, you know, they were never a huge band, but they were kind of a band's band, and they had a cool thing going for a bit, and 
and they broke up, I don't know, uh, six, seven years ago or something. And, and they all kind of just went their separate ways and just went and, you know, got real jobs and just did their own thing. And, you know, it was, you know, I don't know, about a year ago, Bobby's like, he's like, hadn't picked up his guitar in forever. And he's like, well, you know, I want to, he started recording some songs and he, and he sent them to me. I'm like, well, these are really cool. Like, what do you want to do? You know? And, and I think on a whim, he sent them to the, the, the old singer from Gatsby's is Nick Newsham. And, and I didn't know he was doing that. And then Nick just, he wrote some vocals for it. And it was really cool. And I was like, Oh man, we gotta, we gotta do this. And, uh, so, I mean, I didn't, I didn't charge them. I mean, like they've been my bros forever and so I, I said let's just get in the studio and start working on this and it was it was the best one of the best moments I've had in since I've been recording where you know it was just the three of us it was just you know because there wasn't anyone else involved and so we they come to the studio and it was like it was all it was so much fun because they'd learned from all their past mistakes of you know and gotten over all the the bs of you know being insecure musicians and trying to impress other people like they literally were in there to make their favorite record and like something that they want to listen to and just to have fun and it was it was the, one of the most enjoyable experiences i've ever had and and it was like there was never fighting and it was just like if we didn't like something there was no egos hurt you know it was like it was almost people almost thrived on that. Like if I said that, I don't like that part, they'd be like, gosh, thank you. You know, like, cause I, I, they, they were able to take the criticism like in a, in a good way and be like, yeah, I'm, you know, thank you for telling me that that's not the best way to do that. Let's try something else. And I don't know. It, it, it's kind of like this culmination of everything we've been talking about, where it was like this like perfect situation of just fun and, and creatively awesome. It was such a great experience. I, I think you also touched on like two things that are really good ingredients to like making a great record, which like one is like, you know, I always say like, I've never worked with a band who's trying to make music for other people that make a good record. They're just making it for themselves and making what they want to hear. And I think that's the music that makes great music. Mm -hmm. And then two, being open and humble and not having to think about outside concerns. Like, um, there's this really great Rick Rubin quote from uh, the singer, the Dixie Chicks, who I'm not really prone to quoting too often. But uh, <laughs> like she said that like the thing Rick Rubin does is he gets you to stop thinking about outside concerns and just think about the most interesting thing you could say to yourself. Like, what would you want to hear and what do you need right now? Exactly. And um. I was telling you about that podcast I did and it was with Bobby for, for the first, for the first Gatsby's record I did. And we actually talked a lot about this where back then you'd say, I don't like that part, you know, and he'd get super butthurt about it and just like, you know, well, duh, that's, that's a really cool part. Cause I wrote it, you know, and versus like now, and it's like, you kind of grow up and you go and, and you're, and you almost, everyone kind of, we all were kind of jazzed about like tearing the songs apart. Like, yeah, let's make these the best songs possible. Like, I, you know, I'd be like, dude, let's get rid of that guitar solo thing. Like that doesn't need to be there. It's, you think it's cool, but it's like, we're losing momentum through the song. And he's like, you're right. Cool. You know, and it's such a, it's such a refreshing thing to happen. And, and you can't blame, you know, especially when kids are just getting started out and they're just writing music and it's precious. It's so precious to them, you know, but I, I would say a, a, a thing of advice for, for bands is like, as try to try to i mean it's not easy but try to grow up as quickly as possible you know and and if you're going to work with somebody let them you know let them work you know like let you know that's i guess this kind of brings me to another thing is there's been those bands that come in and they they've like they're like Casey do do what you do like like you know please like we are here because we want to work with you so like take you know take this part out or tell us we need to redo this and they they like that they like that i'm engaged in like saying you know versus a band that's so worried about everything else and then you know they aren't going to let anybody change anything about their music yeah no i think that's a great thing i think like even it's not always even as much growing up as realizing like it's a challenge for your creativity of just like Hey, if this person doesn't like the part, maybe I need to try a little harder. Like maybe I need to realize, like maybe I didn't edit this enough, enough. Maybe I didn't consider it enough. Maybe I don't have enough objectivity to see that this isn't working for outside of people outside of me because I've lost my objectivity. And just have that humility that maybe you can do better, and this is a chance to rise to an occasion. That that's a much better way of putting it. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's. I mean, really, that's a, that's exactly what I was trying to say. Yeah. Tell me one of the worst moments you had in the studio and what you learned from it. 
this doesn't have anything to do with uh, working with the band. It was a mistake I made, and uh, and <laughs> this is one that really helped me down the line. But I, in my in my uh, in the st- when I ran a full studio. Um, I built it and I, I kind of had like a, a control room, uh, like a, a couple ISO booths and stuff. And the way the control room was oriented, it was right next to uh, my uh, my small ISO booth for my guitars. And for whatever reason, I had the bright idea to on the on the outside wall of that booth, I had like some shelves and I had my, uh, my all my hard drives plugged in, like for you know backup and not not even backup, just like my hard drives and and. Totally not think you know, and I'm not in the habit of backing stuff up. Well, if you know, if you're playing loud guitar, it vibrates everything in the room, and so I, you know, was in the middle. I lost an entire record because my one of my drives was sitting on that shelf, just being vibrated all day long, and it just crashed out on me, and and uh, I had not backed it up. Wow! So I had to. Uh, I mean, I hadn't done any vocals yet, but we had to go back and redo all guitars, bass, drums, you know, almost almost everything. And it was one of the, one of those things where I, you've just got to be crazy. You got to back everything up. Even I mean, it's it that's some of the best advice I can give to when you're starting out. Make sure you got two hard drives for everything. Um, it's really funny. So this is the second one I've taped of the day, and it's a near identical story. And the one before, I don't know which order these are going to air in. But I, I think the overall majority of the things so far in this podcast is which I think is kids put it on two drives, get it in the cloud, do something. I know. Because <laughs> we've all done it. And like the other story I told in the last podcast is um, I learned under uh, Alan Douchess, the mastering engineer, and uh, he told a story that I believe it was Jack Douglas who produced like John Lennon and Aerosmith uh, would say – to a engineer before uh, they would punch it on tape if they were going to be his engineer, he'd say, "Have you ever erased a vocal?" And the engineer would just, tendency would be just like, "Of course not." He's like, "Great, you can't work with me because you'll never be as careful as you will if you've uh, already erased one." That's amazing, <laughs> and it's totally true. It's it's just it's a you you, you know they say like you don't lose uh, the carpenter uh, is never as careful until after they've lost the first finger. No, you need to have the fear of God in you when you're doing this, because yeah, you, until you have that that time when it, you know, hopefully it's not bad like me, but you you need you need to have that experience and go, okay, this is a major priority for me from now on. Yeah, and I think like what's also very indicative of this is uh, that I'm asking people this, and obviously this happened to you many many years ago, and it still is like haunting you, and you're like scared of it. Oh yeah. And I, I think that that's a really good uh, indicator of this, of how important this is to uh, do. Next question is, uh, tell me about a record you did that changed your life. The easy answer would be I did a record for a band called Chiodos, um, uh, called Bone Palace Ballet. And um, it it opened a lot of doors for me, um, good and bad. Uh, I kind of, I mean, you, you've kind of got a a little bit of a hint here that I grew up listening to punk rock and that's my thing. Like I just, and I mean, I have got the softest spot for, you know, good old fashioned punk rock. And so I, going into these heavier bands, I hadn't, I hadn't really done much of that before. And I I have a lot of respect for those guys. Um, They picked me like, I mean, they, they could have gone with anybody. I mean, honestly, they, they, they were on top of the world at that point. They had done their first record all's well, and it was killing it. And, I mean, literally anybody, and they they wanted to go with somebody that was like they wanted to keep it a little bit. You know, they didn't want to go to Feldman just yet. I mean, this is before Feldman was really Feldman, but they didn't want to go to that caliber of a guy yet. So they wanted someone that was still like in the scene, maybe a little underground, which was me. And uh, really, you know, I, I kind of became a screamo guy for a, for a bit after that. But uh, you know, what one of the coolest things for me now is. One of my favorite things is to work with unsigned bands. And a lot of that comes from what we've been talking about earlier of just getting a band in here that's just wide eyed and excited and like just, you know, they're just so happy to be there. And versus, you know, a lot of the bands that are just a little, they've done it a few times and it's just a little bit of going through the motions. And, you know, it's, it's, I, I love the drive of an unsigned band. And, it's cool now because these bands that are coming in are all like, I, I listened to that Chiodos record in high school. You know, I, I like, and that's, that's their, 
Blink-182 for me, you know, like they grew up, they grew up, you know, I know that record wasn't the biggest thing ever, but it was big. No, that was a, was a very ubiquitous yeah. record, though, for any teenage angsty musician, for sure. Yeah, and so that's kind of been one of the coolest, I, like, rewarding things for me is to is to start, uh, is working with a lot of the, of the younger bands, like, you know, this last year or so, and, and they're kind of like... You know, like wow, you did that record, and I'm like, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> yeah, it didn't you know, seem like much at the time, I guess. Sure. Yeah. So I, I mean, I, I definitely think you know, that's definitely that that one, and then uh, the other one that's kind of coming around is uh, I did the first Pierce the Veil record, and those guys are just blowing up right now, which is I could not be happier about for them. Yeah, arguably one of the biggest bands out there. Uh, it, it is just so cool. I mean. Yeah, I've, I've had, I don't, I don't know, I don't know why, uh, but I've got like, I, I've done f- like kind of like, not even like first records, but kind of like these inception records for bands where the labels kind of on the fence about whether or not they're gonna keep them, and they're like sending them to me, and they're like do something, and if it's good, we're gonna keep going with them. If it's not, we're gonna cut ties. And that was like, that was like. Portugal the Man, Pierce the Veil. I did a band called Memphis Mayfire that was like that. Uh, you know, there's a couple other ones. I don't know why I I don't know why that's I that is the role I've kind of fallen into, but yeah, with Pierce the Veil it was that. It was they they were actually a band called Before Today on Equal Vision. Oh, I didn't and, realize they were Before Today. Yeah, and so they I was supposed to do the Before Today record, like the you know, and it was Equal Vision was kind of like we don't know if we're gonna, you know, we because things had really slowed down for them, and so they sent in Mike and Vic, the the two brothers in Pierce the Veil, and it was really it was like the three of us, and we just banged out that first Pierce the Veil record, and nothing happened. I mean, like <laughs> it just landed with a you know crickets, and you know, and I just they kept plugging away and plugging away and plugging away. And it's like, I've just like, so, and they're the nicest, coolest guys. And I'm like, so happy. Like, they're just like, I see their Instagram and they're playing these huge venues and stuff. And I, I, it's just, that's one, that's one of the more, that's one of the more fun stories for me is to see how well those guys have done. Yeah. That's really killer. And so that's one of the other things like, yeah, you've worked with like on the side of things, you've done some pretty expansive stuff. Like uh, I don't think a lot of people think of Gatsby's American dream, Portugal, the man, and, uh, Pierce the Veil Chiodos to have as much to do with each other. So you you come from a punk rock background. What do you think makes it you able to understand all that that music? I think there's like so many producers who really just do one thing, but you're obviously balancing a wide palette of things. Uh, It was really important to me from the get go to uh, to to spread out as kind of as much as possible. Now the the thing that that is linking all of these bands is the scene that they were in now i mean it's it's kind of crazy now but it's like i mean you know pierce the veil i think they might have toured with gatsby's who also toured with portugal the man who uh pierce the veil i think probably toured with chiodos and like you've got there was you know now portugal the man has completely gone out they're not in that you know what you you know quote unquote call the scene but like i was like i will i wanted to do you know, everything from one end of the spectrum to the other, like within that world. And so it was really important to me to like, to, to seek out like the Portugal demands. And then, you know, when the heavier stuff started coming in, I was like, you know, I really need to stay on top of this. And, you know, I, I who did I did, uh, I did a band called heavy, heavy low. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember them. Um, and a guy I'm good friends with Nick Storch. He's like a booking agent and he was kind of doing a record label and he'd sign them and he, and he brought them to me. And I mean, that record at the time I was like, I had never done anything like that. I mean, it's just, it's, it's a dirty, wacky record. And I'm like, and I told him straight up, I'm like, honestly, man, I don't like, this isn't my thing. Like I'm, you've heard what I've done before. And he, in his, he was like, that's why I want you to do it. And he's like, I, I want you to do this because you don't do this kind of a thing. And I was, and I, I don't, that's not a, that's not a usual thing a label or anyone comes to a producer and says. Yeah, but, uh, it's not, not the average label insight. No. And so for whatever reason, and, and he was, and he was super happy with how it came out and, and stuff. But I, it, yeah, it, but it was also one of those things where, I, I wanted it. I wanted to do it because it was again. It was going to expand. You know this kind of like spectrum of like super soft indie rock type stuff to this 
to you know heavy hardcore crazy stuff and uh yeah yeah i i I've, i always prided myself in in trying to get as much stuff under my umbrella as possible and the one thing that's eluded me this entire time is an awesome punk rock record and uh, it drives me crazy that's kind of funny that and that's like so so when you say you grew up on punk rock what, what did you grow up on uh, well, actually, I was going to say, my answer to the question I thought was the record that changed my life would have been Blink-182's Cheshire Cat. Okay, yeah, very, very punk record. Yeah, and I, I mean, up until that point, I was all like, I listened to like Blind Melon and Pearl Jam and Soundgarden, you know, and I was just, and I, and I, for no reason, like they were, it was just popular and, I, you know, and. And I was sitting in a car like at 10, 11 o'clock at night, you know, bumming out about a girl. And like my buddy puts on this Blink-182 record and, and plays the song Wasting Time. And I immediately go, you know, and I'd started playing guitar a little bit at this point, And I was like, this sounds like something that I could do. <laughs> like, you know, and I mean, that's the whole thing with Blink, you know, and it was it was always something that everyone, every fan felt like they could be in that band or part of that band. And so especially if they saw how sloppy they were live. <laughs> <laughs> the worst. I don't even know. I, I don't know what do you like? I, I would love to see the sessions to that live record. I would love to oh, see man. how because it's, it's an insanely good sounding live record, and and that band has never <laughs> they were never even close to sounding that good. Yeah, uh, it, it, it really is something. Oh, uh, it's crazy. But I that got me. I mean, like the next day, I'm at the CD store trading in all my Pearl Jam and Sound Gardens to get rid of all this stuff. And I'm pick, you know, and, I, and all of a sudden I can't have enough. I'm like, I, you know, I want Propagandi and No Effects and Lagwagon strung out, you know, and and literally every. I mean, I'm like to the point where I'm like subdividing punk rock into all these other genres. I'm like, like Pennywise sounds nothing like Lagwagon. You know, like this, 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 two different things. <laughs> that you know that, that I mean? is splitting genre hairs, Casey. <laughs> no, I know. As I'm saying, like I, I, I became like just this punk rock kid. I mean, for years, I just only like if a band didn't play, you know, the fast, you know, I didn't want anything to do with them. I, I always held it against Pulley because they wouldn't play the fast beat. They'd kind of do a close to fast beat. And so... You know, I, I I don't know I, but I'm like I love that music and it's it's been the one thing where I'm like I, I had I actually had a band they were pretty cool and I don't know like two months ago or something and I got them on the phone and I'm like guys I know this music let me do it and and they're kind of like you did Chiodos <laughs> and I'm like ah oh, they're like holding it come against on. you yeah. <laughs> well that's I think that's one of the funniest things about when you do have a diverse discography is like people can treat like a certain band like an infection that you have and it's like yeah that doesn't mean that was my favorite thing I was just able to do it like for example I have a Limp Bizkit record in my discography and it's like <laughs> you know every that could haunt you yeah every band that I turned down when they called me about uh when I was doing that record would be like never wanted to speak to me again like it, they treated it like it was a disease. I I think Chiodos is kind of a polarizing band in that way. Is that there's a lot of kids who grew up on that, but then there's some people who are like, "Fuck this band." Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so staying with this theme, tell me about five records in your musical growth that were really important. Probably. So there's one like punk record that is like the one for me, and it's still one of my favorite things. It's not even a record. It's that it's No Effects is the Decline. Oh yeah, that's the best. I mean. I, it's that that was so influential on me and it is just the most incredible punk work punk rock work or whatever you call it like it's just it's the best and so that is definitely up there i learned how to play that song on guitar all the way through and i just i i mean i, I think even now i could probably play like the first four or five minutes of that song I, that, uh, that, that, that's uh, that, that's quite a feat actually i'd say blink 182's dude ranch was probably i mean uh, I was, I mean, I, I, I probably saw Blink three or four times before Dude Ranch even came out. Like that was, I was that into that band before even that record. And that was one of those first, it's kind of like how I was saying with Pierce the Veil. It's like, I woke up one morning and damn, it was on the radio. And I was, the, I was the happiest. I was, I couldn't believe it. I was like, I was like this little band that was like my favorite band in high school. And all of a sudden, you know, and, and I, and I think that record's insanely good. And then, and then kind of, Slowly coming out of my punk rock world, uh, I would say "Saves the Days Through Being Cool" was my, my, my the the subtle transition from you know, and and it was kind of along with them at the same time too of like 
slowing it down a little bit and not having the punk beat going the entire time. And, uh, I mean, Save the Day is probably my favorite band. Uh, I saw you, uh, you worked on, uh, Sound the Alarm, Alarm, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And I, I, you know, I grew up, uh, with those guys. So, um, oh, you know the guys. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, I, if I look back at show pictures, Chris is in every one of them, even though we weren't the closest of friends, but like I have pictures from like Lifetime's last show and it's like Chris and I oh, wow. next to each other. It's like, you know, I mean, we got done with that, right? We started doing that record. It was funny, but yeah. And then, uh, I grew up working under Steve Evans who did that. And like, I actually, the last oh, podcast right, I did right. with Rob Free, I was talking about, I was like, you know, first week I was working with Evans, uh, we were at Tracks East. I was like, all right, can I hear the real? And like just sat there hitting solo on like every track on that record, being like, "Oh my oh, god, that's awesome!" Yeah, be like, "How did you get a JCM 2000 to sound that good?" <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, "Well, that's Dave and Chris's hands." There was a band I did a couple years ago, a few years ago, called uh, Doctor Manhattan. Oh yeah, 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 they're crazy. And yeah, and I they did. Uh, it was actually uh, like I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty tough when it comes to music. Like I don't listen to I have a hard time finding good stuff I like mm-hmm. like new stuff. And, I agree with you. Same problem. Yeah. Yeah, and and uh, it was actually Bobby from Gatsby's. He sends me this song called Big Chomper, and it was this the title track off of Doctor Manhattan's first record. And he sends me this song just out of the blue one day, and, and and I turn it on, and I'm just like, oh my gosh! I'm like, what is this? And I. I just like, I found the producer's email. I'm like, dude, this is awesome. I was like, you did an incredible job. Like I got to the van. I'm like, I, I love this record. And they're like, well, actually we're trying to remix this record right now. Um, Cause the label doesn't like how it sounds. And, and I'm like, give me a song. I know exactly what to do. And they gave me a song and they had been to like 10 different mixers. And I did the song and they like, they're like, that's exactly what we wanted. I'm like, I know it's <laughs> like, this is exactly, you know, it's like, this is what you guys should sound like. And I, and I, so I kind of formed this relationship with the band. I, I mixed their first record and then Saves the Day picked them up and started touring with them. And so Chris became good friends with the band. And uh, when it came time to do their next record, I, I co-produced it with Chris. Oh, and, wow. Uh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. And so Chris came up to Seattle, spent, I think we spent like two or three weeks and the band came up and uh, we all stayed at my house and we did... Uh, we did Dr. Manhattan's second record together and it was, it was a trip because I mean, like you see, I mean, like I was a huge saves the day fan. I mean, like, like I'm, you know, in reverie is incredible. Like I love that record and everyone hated that record, but you know, it, it, it was just, it was one of those cool things where I'm like, you know, I would have never, you know, dreamed of getting to work with a guy like Chris and, and he's, he's a, he's a sweetheart. He's yeah, a cool guy. That best dude. Best dude. Um, so then kind of coming out of that, I, I, uh, the band that really transitioned me from punk into like everything else was a band called Phantom Planet. Oh yeah. Yeah. Those records are great. Yeah. And, and, uh, it was, um, it was that record that, that, uh, had Cal- the, 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 the song California the, the hit, on it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, but I'd, I'd been listening, that record was out for a long time before it, it got on the OC and was, became that thing that it was, but it was the record after that, their self-titled record. The that one they is, did with uh, Dave Fridman? I believe so. Yeah, that um, record really is really crazy. It is, it is, it is, it might be my favorite production of all time, like, it, and it, it, it's probably influenced me more than just about any other production, and, and I just loved, I think that record's almost flawless, like, it's just... It's it's the dirtiest, loudest sounding record. I mean, like if you should you should pop that on sometime and see how I'm going to do it after like, we're done. To be honest with you, I, it I is the loudest it. record you've ever heard. And I mean, just because it fits with the theme of like everything is distorted and stuff. But that band kind of brought me out of my punk rock haze and, and into the other the world of because that the record before that they is pretty diverse like they there's some softer songs and a little heavier songs and stuff and i loved them all and then but they're they're self-titled it's all just dirty rock and 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 nuts um and then that got me into like kind of like my two favorite bands now which is the killers and the strokes and probably my favorite record of all time is killer sam's town yeah well that's a, that's a great record i mean i didn't like that band on their first record the one that blew up and everyone loved and i and I remembered before Samstown came out, Brandon Flowers had posted or said something along the lines of like, this is the best record in the last 20 years, you know, and I like, I, I know people don't like it, but I like love it when bands like say stuff like that. Cause I just like, I'm like, Oh, you're gonna, you're gonna crash and burn buddy. Like you can't say stuff like that. And, and then I heard that record and I was like, this is, this is the best record in the last 20 years. Like I, I mean, 
I just personally like that, you know, when we're young, I've, I've heard that song probably more than any song I've ever heard in my life. And I still love hearing that song. And, and I've, I've played that record, you know, I, it, it's not the greatest record of all time. I mean, it's, it's, it's not, but it's probably the record I've listened to the most since then. I mean, I don't know, the last 10 years or so. And yeah, so, you know, now I've got like, I'm a little more eclectic with my tastes. <laughs> it's still rock and roll, but, uh, so yeah, it is funny because like that's one of that song when you were young is like one of those songs like I remember the first time I heard it I just was like okay hit repeat ten times and figure out what yeah. makes this <laughs> so fucking mind blowing and so simple. Well, how, I still can't figure it out. I'm yeah. like, how how have I never gotten tired of that song? I don't know. Yeah, there's it, the melodic sense that they had for that moment was just impeccable. I, I love the first record too. That's like that's a record I like always go back to. But uh, so what is a perfect record? And why? What's a perfect? Well, I actually gave an example of what I think is the perfect. Yeah, record. I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear and why, which one and why. My example was Third Eye Blind's self-titled record. Oh wow, yeah. This it, it's not a perfect song. I mean, this you know, I mean, there's a million classic records out there and stuff like that. But when I, I'm my favorite producer is Eric Valentine. Oh yeah, he's one of the kings. I mean, and. This record was done in 97 so we're we're approaching 20 years ago and it's it's this like masterful like the tones on this record and are it's so in, insanely varied. I mean like you listen to every song on that not only is it a classic record I mean like every song sounds different and they and the tones are just the most beautiful. I mean I, I he he is a guy that I I strive for. I mean what I've no, what I know about him is that my workflow and my style could not be more opposite than his workflow and style. How, so, so can you tell us how so? Well, um, I was actually going to ask you about this too. I, cause like there's, there's, there's kind of like these two types of, I mean, to put it in very general terms, I, I kind of look at it as two types of uh, engineers or, or producers or whatever in that there's the audio file types and then there's the non audio file types. And I'm, or gear guys, I guess, mm-hmm. you know, like I'm, I'm the anti gear guy. Like I, I'm, I want, I like stuff simple and, you know, going into a, an old recording studio with, you know, a Neve from the 1970s where they're pretty sure half the channels are working properly, you know, and, you know, this, the 1176 in the rack, you know, it had a buzz last week and we think it's, you know, I, I really don't like, even going way back to what we're talking about, like momentum and stuff. Like when you're in the studio, I want stuff to be able to work. I like my setups to be real quick. And so I really embraced the simple side of things. Whereas like, I mean, I know there's like, you know, Eric is just this audiophile guru with, you know, he's making his own gear Mm -hmm. and own console. Yeah. You know, and, and going so far as to like, when he mics up a drum kit, he's running a 10 foot mic cable into a mic pre in that's in the drum room so that there's not a long line, but like he's just cutting down at every possible area and stuff. So I was going to ask you, are you, are you more on the side of the audio, the gear guy or, or the simple side? So this, this is funny is I was the worst. Um, funny enough, I sold, I used to have a parts of the Fleetwood Mac uh, rumors console. Um, and I spent, <laughs> so you were, you were, so, you were hardcore. Oh my God. Like I was so bad circa 2001 to like four. And oh, wow. I actually sold Eric Valentine those strips after I got done with them. And oh, wow. um, I went the total opposite is I hit this thing where, and I believe this very much so is that um, knowing your gear is just like playing a guitar is that, I did this band from Belgium, and they had done a record in a studio that literally had a Neve 1073 rack and a full SSL 4000G. And it mm-hmm. sounded worse than everything my interns have ever recorded when they showed me their resume. And they spent like 60 days recording, and they came in. And I know my gear, and I, I do not... I have a million amps, million guitars, million drums, but we have just enough mic pre's to do 20 channels and we have no like i probably have eight compressors and i could have all this stuff if i want to but i don't because i find it very serious take it very seriously that i know every bit of my gear inside and out and then just like you said and that it works every fucking day and i don't lose (laughs) the take and i don't have to think about i don't want to think about 
the million creative options I have, I don't want option paralysis. I just want to think about the song and think about the performance and how we make something compelling. I, I was kind of hoping we were going to talk about this because that's, I mean, uh, it's really cool to hear you say that because like that is exactly where the realization that I came to where it's like, I want... I want to know, like, rather than having everything and thinking that, oh, I just, if I get that, it's going to make, um, that's going to take me to the next level or that. And that's, you know, focusing on the good stuff that you have and learning it inside out, knowing how it really works. And, you know, I, I, I cannot stress that enough. And it's kind of my, my mantra when I talk to other, you know, people that are learning how to record. I'm like, you know what? An SM57 has been used on I mean, it's 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 not the most expensive mic. It's not the cheapest mic, but it it's been used a million times to to get great guitar tones. You don't need to overthink it at this point. It, it really and, is true. That's the same thing I use too. Is I it's it's two SM fifty sevens. It's the same thing I've been using for ever since I had that realization and stopped using crazy mics on guitars. Yeah, you know, it, well, and and this is the example I like to give is you know how that 57 is supposed to sound and you, you know, and, and you're probably running it a lot of times you might be running it through the same, you know, uh, you know, mic, yeah, some sort of 1073. Yeah. Thing. yeah. And, and so, you know, that when the guitars aren't sounding good, that it's not that, and that's such a huge part of the process. You know, it's like, you can take that out the window and you can go, all right, let's look at this amp. Let's look at this, the player. Let's look at the guitar. Let's look at the other factors that are, that are causing this to not sound good. And if you can take that mentality and apply it to the entire process, like throughout, you're going to, you're going to become an instantly better engineer because I, I, I don't know. I just can't, I can't stress that enough. That, that, like, this is, are, this is amazing gear. advice. Yeah. I, you're putting it very well is that what you have, when you know a certain chain and you're not in this constant experimentation is that you're just like, Hey, that's not working. Okay, I have a Telecaster over here that you have a Telecaster. Let me hear how this amp sounds with my Telecaster. Then I'm going to know if it's your guitar is a problem. And, yes. you know, if we're putting a Rode NT2 on the guitar cab, that's not what I do every day, but I may do it on a, a one weird day a year. I'm going to know that maybe it's the NT2 if I just put up the 57 if there's a problem. Yes, yes. You know, and here's a funny thing about me when, it, when as, as far as I've taken this and that, like, I, I, you know, probably for the last, I mean, geez, since, I don't know, maybe like the last eight years or so, I've, on almost every single thing I've done, I've used this Rode NT2A into a, a Focusrite ISA mic pre into Pro Tools for every vocalist I've done. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, that seems crazy because, I mean, you, you, you see the, you know, the mic battles where you set up three mics in front of a singer, have them sing into it, and everyone sits around and critiques, you know, what they like and don't like about it. And uh, I, I love the simplicity of I, I know this sounds good. I've used it on just about everything, and and also it uh, it depends on the type of music. I should say. I mean, you know, when I, when we're talking like rock music and, and the majority of stuff I do, I mean, by the time I'm compressing it three times and EQing it and reverbs and delays. I don't think it's, I personally don't think that it's worth the, the waste of time to go through and try to find, you know, some magic mic that you can barely tell the difference, you know, only when you're, you know, sitting up next to the studio monitors in the studio and A being, uh, I, I, I think that's a waste of time. I don't know. What you're saying here is also a thing that I think that like 60% of people who do this for like 10 years get to the same thing. Like most of my friends now it's like we have one vocal chain and if it's not working we may go okay i gotta yeah, switch yeah. this up like i will go to our sm7 or our road and t1 every once in a while like every hundredth band but usually it's gonna be my sound deluxe microphone into my pendulum and that's been my chain for almost every record i've done for 10 years and they don't teach that, right? They like don't. that's not some that's that's like not widely like the idea that a producer uses the same mic for everything I, I, I think it's like a a thing where I mean I kind of say it proudly because I I kind of like the 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 drama of it a little bit because bands immediately get like weirded out by it they're like well you're not even trying <laughs> like well I'm like no like I know it that's the thing is like I know how this is supposed to sound and it's like and that and that is so much more valuable than you know spending all this time trying to come up with something. To, to appease your you know thoughts of how it's you you envisioned or you think you've heard things go and uh, it, it's just so interesting like 
simple. We, we sadly have a gear industrial complex of a bunch of guys who don't do work um, sitting on message boards all day talking about how they have this expansive thing and how they take pictures of their studio all day because they're not working. And yeah. the fact of the matter is you have a discography that shows results, not reasons. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, there's a like funny saying I like to say that's probably not the um, best for public consumption all the time, but it's like the end justifies the means. I know it's a Hitler quote, but in recording, <laughs> no one cares how you got there. Like I always look back to that Rage Against the Machine first record where it's like, this is all natural sounds. There's no sampling. There's no record scratching. 95% of people don't give a fuck about that disclaimer. They just care if they feel the music. And the reason that record worked was not because of this aesthetic they had. It's because people felt it. Absolutely. It's probably more like 99%. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good, good point. And like, at the end of the day, no one cares if you tried four microphones out. They care if they felt it and you get great performances, which is why your discography works. That's in at the end of the day, isn't that? I mean, that, that's the whole thing. I mean, it's 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 creating something that that feels good. I mean, and, and uh, I, I just did that creative live class and it was uh, it was actually a, an example of mixing one of those money pit songs we were talking about earlier and I was trying to explain I mean like it's a tough thing you know explaining taste wise like why you do things but like for me most stuff comes the reason I do things is for the feel of it and not so much and in a weird way it's not so much the sonics of, of the whole thing like what I'm hearing it's like how does it feel with everything else going on like I, I got no real uh, that's not a good way to explain it but like uh, that's the only way i know how what you're saying is what everybody who does great work says and like this is why you're being interviewed right now is because you know well enough to let your emotions guide you and the reason that most of these people on the message boards never get an interview with, with them anywhere is they're thinking about the gear and how much did i pay for this and did i try the most expensive thing versus this instead of just how does this fucking feel? Yeah. Yeah. And you're, you're losing. I touched on it in the class a little bit where, you know, when I first got started, I'd be like, I would, I'd solo a, a hi hat track and just spend hours like agonizing over the EQ of an, of a, of a stupid hi hat, you know? And then, whereas now it's like, I don't even, I don't, I don't even think about it. I put it in there and if it feels right, I'm like, cool, move on, you know? And it, it's just don't overthink stuff. And that's the other thing. Yeah. I, and I, now I granted, I think there is a difference between like when you get to a more advanced level, like where we are in our careers yes, and yes. when you're young, I think you do need to do that to learn how to do things. Cause you don't know how to get the good sounds and those hours spent when you're young doing it. But there also comes a time like that doesn't need to be the part of your process every day. Like, you know, when I first started working for Steve Evitz or Ross Robinson, seeing how fast they could do some things, I was like, I had that tendency. I'm like, bam, do they just not care? And no, it's that they know how to get results fast. And when it's working, they can move on. Uh, absolutely. Good example. What uh, is it? I know you were saying that you have the same thing as me, that it's like, you know, there's not a lot that inspires you these days. But what is something recently that... Uh, musically that has inspired you so there's a band um that just came out equal vision called better off oh i love that record um you know and and i uh i i swear I, I, the weirdest thing but i swear that artwork makes me like that record more <laughs> that's funny like, I, so for I, the for the listener it's a gigantic peanut butter sandwich well it's just so striking i don't know i i i immediately I I for, I like gave I immediately liked the band without even hearing it. I was like, that's so cool. Like it's just like the, the least like scene cover art or thing. I don't even know what you you know. It doesn't even seem to really fit with the band. I don't even think. But it's just well, they have a good sense of humor on social yeah. media. Yeah, and uh, man, I listen. The record's so good. I just like listen to it in in you know in the in the best way possible. It reminds me of about ten years ago. I don't know you know the the production of it, the the songs like. It's just, it's, it's been a fun record to listen to. And it's one of the, like, it's, it literally is one of the, like, I don't even know, like the last year or so that, that I've already played that record more than just about any other record. Huh. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that's a great record. What about you? I want to, I, maybe I can find something cool to listen to. What are you listening to? Wow. What am I? Well, you know, the funny thing is I'm listening to that record. I re recently, uh, I listened to a lot of the new Frank Turner record. I think that's oh, a I really good to that. And then my my top one for uh, the mo the most recent years is uh, the 1975. Oh yeah, I've been listening to that for two years more than any other record. Um, 
So that that's it for rock. I also listen to lots of really bad dance music at times because the uh, you ever listen to a record because you're like, I don't know how to do this. Oh, all the time. Yeah, and that, that's <laughs> like what dance music always is for me is it's like I know how to get most sounds in rock, but I don't know how to get every sound I hear in dance music. I mean, there's records where I'm like, I I will listen to a bad record because I like the production, and then, and then vice versa. There's actually like good records that I can't listen to because how they sound. Yeah, I, I always joke those are laptop records because then I won't pay attention to the recording. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I love that 1975 record, man. That, that's awesome. What do you think of that new song they just released? Uh, you know, it's like too David Bowie, too in excess for me. I just heard it for the first time this morning. Okay, I, and I and I was I was like, oh, this is. It's not really, it doesn't, it's, it's not striking me the way that that, that, that last record is, that's for sure. But yeah. We'll see. I, I, I'll wait, because honestly, they are another one, like, I think we, were, we actually touched on this, like, there's so many times I hear a band, and I'm like, ugh, and then they become my favorite band. When I first heard Sex, I was like, this is really fucking cheesy, dude. Like, it's <laughs> as cheesy as a Third Eye Blind record. Yeah, yeah. So the last question is, tell me about what you've been working on lately and uh, tell us about some of the projects that uh, what you've been doing in them. Uh, aside, so the Money Pit was the last thing that I did that just came out. Um, so happy with that. Uh, you know, it's not like a, they're not going to like hit the road and start touring. It's it's more of just like a passion project kind of a thing. And, and so it's just cool to have. And, you know, I, it's actually one of my favorite records just like i mean I, I didn't it's kind of one of those things too where i because i'm not writing with bands like i, I get to listen to them like a fan and so yeah. I, I absolutely love it um and then most of man like may through august so may june july like almost four months i spent working with uh, portugal the man on their new record oh wow that's pretty cool yeah and it's uh so the beginning of the year was just a lot of uh, I was working with a lot of unsigned bands, some cool stuff, uh, and then Portugal came around, and, and I've been with them since, like, like I said, they were that band. Like the label sent them to me, and they're like, "We don't think we're going to keep these guys, but if you do a cool song, maybe we will." And that's literally how it started with them. And so, you know, I, I did their first two records, and it, it was like what I was saying. I'm like, I just kind of like after I did those first two records, I'm like, "You guys did good by me," you know. You came back into the second one, and go on, you know go on and, mm -hmm. you know do your own thing and and they've they've included me in just about every record in some capacity you know like having me come in and co-produce for a part or you know help work on this or that and that's kind of like what this was i'm not i'm not like the full-on producer of their new record they're i mean they're on a i think atlantic and uh you know they've got really cool people that they're working with but uh we've always had just kind of a cool relationship and so i just uh they needed a place to write, so they came up to Seattle, and, and we kind of bounced around uh, a couple different studios up here for several weeks, and then went down to California and Hollywood and worked on, you know, just kept plugging away and writing, and just, it was more or less like a uh, an insane pre-production kind of a thing, and so we did that, I did that pretty, you know, that kind of felt like it took up my entire year, and uh, they're going to, I think, go on and finish the record here shortly, we'll see, I might... Might go back in there with him for a little bit, but I don't know. I don't know. But that's, I mean, that's kind of been it. I is a crazy, it, it just took up all my time. So I'm kind of like relaxing right now. That sounds like the type of big project that rarely gets done these days, but they're a band with as ambitious means to be able to do something like that. Well, I've never, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, exactly. I haven't, I haven't been, I haven't, I haven't been involved in a project where a band is afforded several several months to uh, dick around in the studio. So uh, it, it was very, very eye-opening and, and but fun and, and interesting. The coolest guys, like it just one of the one of the bands that I like. They kind of like the pay it forward thing. I mean, like they if any you know if they've ever had any help from anyone through the years growing up, like they will go out of their way to help that person. Or you know, it's just it's it's been really cool uh, being friends with those guys. Yeah. That's awesome. So lastly, you're doing a podcast. Can you tell the listeners about what uh, your podcast is? Yeah, so I did. Uh, I, I got one episode in. It's not out yet. It's going to be out, um, I don't know, probably within the week. Uh, okay, so they'll be out by the time. People won't hear this for a few weeks. So. Oh, okay. So yeah, uh, I, I have a podcast. I think I don't think we have a name yet. I think it's probably just going to be like the Casey Bates podcast, as clever as that is. <laughs> Wait, what's the what? Yeah, I, I have, I've had the hardest time. Like, they wanted me to come up with some sort of riff on Bates Motel or something. But I'm like, I don't, uh, I, yeah. I, I, I don't know if that's the way to go. You know, it's better for google ability anyway, if it's just yeah. your name. Because like, what are people going to say? They're going to be like, oh, Casey Bates has a cool podcast. He did an episode with this. And then they're going to go, 
oh, cool, what's the dumb name for it? It's called, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, I'm, so not, I, I'm not going to make the uh, the schoolyard uh, master uh, puns for you there, but, you know. Uh, I know, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> I've seen, I've heard them all. Yes, uh, I'm sure. So it's a, it's going to be a podcast. I'm, I'm kind of, I almost look at it like a mini series or something like that. I'm going to, my plan is to go back and kind of, kind of start at the beginning. I'm sure I'll jump around timeline wise, but kind of hit my, my favorite records that I've done with the bands. And so I did, I did a first podcast with Bobby Darling from Gatsby's American Dream. And we, we basically, we did a record together in two count in 05, I think called uh, the volcano. And so we kind of, went through that whole process like you know it's like 90 minutes long just just front to back you know what we remember about it i kind of play i even pulled up the old sessions and kind of played in some parts of some songs in there and 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 it's kind of a neat idea i think just Uh, that's a great idea i can't wait to hear fans yeah and so um you know my i'm I'm hoping I'll, i'll do a couple of these and uh then maybe you know grab some of the bigger bands that i did and and see if i you know I don't. I don't know if I don't know that I'll go beyond the stuff that I've done, but we'll see. Uh, it's just it's it's going to be more like a it's like the extras on a on a DVD or something. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, that's very cool. Well, thanks so much for doing this, dude. I think this was an awesome conversation. That uh... dude, likewise, this is a blast. Yeah. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember the golden rule of the internet, that if you enjoy something you got for free, please tweet, Facebook, share, or tell your friends about it in whatever way you like to do that. Please check out Noise Creator's website and take a look around. We have tons of interviews, discographies, Spotify playlists from all the best producers out there on our service. If you're unsure about who your band should work with, we can help you get the best producer fit for your record. To keep up with us, follow at Noise Creators on Twitter, Instagram, SoundCloud, Tumblr, or Facebook. This podcast can also be found wherever podcasts are found, including iTunes and Stitcher. I'm your host, Jesse Cannon. I can be found on Twitter at Jesse Cannon or at jessecannon.com. Again, please help spread the word about this podcast and what Noise Creators does so we can keep this going.